Hello everyone and welcome to Cine 103 History of Motion Pictures from the very beginning to 1945. This is class two and today we have uh, kind of a grab bag. We're not going to do uh, the movie stars and moguls documentary. Uh, for this class uh, I've got uh, kind of a, a grab bag. We're going to talk about uh, Douglas Fairbanks and technology and how they did some tricks and stuff with the cameras and uh, uh, the history of color in movies. I get lots of questions about that, so I thought I'd address that. And then we're going to dive into the three comedy genius giants of the silent era. And uh, so that's our class for today. And let's dive in. So first up, Douglas Fairbanks. And uh, he was silent era's greatest action star. Okay, we have plenty of action stars uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years, but this is really our very first uh, action star going back uh, to the teens and then through the 1920s. He um, didn't really get very deep into the sound era. We think of Douglas Fairbanks as primarily a silent star. He was a little bit older uh, than a lot of the, uh, the younger people like Chaplin and so on. He was already in his... Uh, mid and late 30s when he became a star. He was making some very interesting movies back in 18, 18, uh, 18 10, or 1910, sorry, 1910, 11, 12, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, he died, um, I think, somewhere around 1930, something like that. So he's, very, he's primarily a silent star. And we're going to talk about this as we go through the class, and especially as we go through the 1920s and the silent era, that uh, a lot of the stars, there's a few like Greta Garbo, but most of the stars of the silent era were not stars in the sound era. Uh, there was a, a big changeover, almost like a whole different sort of a medium. Uh, and so Douglas Fairbanks, he represents that. A big, big, one of the very two, three, four biggest stars in the silent era. And we don't really think about him a whole lot in the sound era. Uh, but there we go with his... Uh, film titles, you can sort of tell that he would have been an action star, The Three Musketeers, Robin Hood. He was a good swordsman. And that's one of the things that uh, Hollywood would do uh, as part of its star-making system. If you weren't good at something and they needed you to be able to do it for a film, maybe ride a horse or, or fencing or who knows what, then you'd get lessons and things like that. So I have no idea uh, if Douglas Fairbanks knew how to fence before making The Three Musketeers. Probably not, uh, but um, after all of these movies, uh, The Thief of Baghdad and things like that, and the various pirate movies, Zorro for sure, uh, the sword, lots of sword play. So uh, anyway, he was a very gifted uh, athlete, and all of the stars in the silent era, at least um, I would say most of the male stars, uh, whether they were action stars like Fairbanks or romantic stars like Valentino or comedy stars like Chaplin, they were very gifted physically. Uh, boy, they could just do amazing things with their bodies and their balance and their agility and all of that. And sometimes maybe we forget with, with sound and uh, uh, talking and scripts and words and all that sort of stuff that a lot of acting is your body. Uh, actors talk about their instrument and how you move and all of that. And even when we get into the uh, sound era with uh, people like Jimmy Cagney, who began as a dancer, and then he made gangster movies. And he moved very nicely. He, he was very graceful. And, and he, uh, I think partly because of his dance training, uh, he moved uh, uh, well. And uh, so that is, you know, the use of his instrument. And, of course, uh, the famous dancers and stuff, Red Astaire, people like that. Okay, anyway... Douglas Fairbanks, he was probably a good dancer. I'm sure he was good at everything. But anyway, he was an action star. And I have a very nice uh, link to Douglas Fairbanks doing stunts. So uh, if you want to, uh, you can uh, stop this right now and go and watch how Douglas Fairbanks did, uh, did uh, his uh, stunts and things like that. It's uh, quite good. So let's talk about special effects in Hollywood. This uh, looks like it's a Georges Méliès film, okay? And 
yes, there were special effects in Hollywood. We talked a little bit about Georges Méliès and how he sort of discovered that when people, or, or when he, he would have his people stop and freeze and then stop cranking the camera and then people could appear or disappear and then he would start cranking the camera again. And once that was sort of edited together, uh, stuff would sort of appear. Maybe he would, he would set off smoke, uh, uh, I hate to call it a smoke bomb, but uh, smoke uh, um, effects and things like that. And, and things would appear and disappear in puffs of smoke uh, and so on. And that was just very simply um, having most of the actors freeze and then having other actors uh, depart the scene or enter the scene and then uh, and uh, uh, the camera would be on a tripod so the background, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, all that stuff would, would basically be uh, the same and stay registered and then stuff could appear or disappear. You will see that. You'll see that in the documentaries and things on uh, camera effects and um, and some of the Fairbanks stuff. So um, make sure you check that out either when I'm done here with this or you can always stop this and go check it out. And those effects in early Hollywood were done in the camera. Okay, they were done in the camera. So not in a lab. Um, aside from um, an edit, uh, of course they didn't have uh, they didn't have rear screen projection yet, which would have saved a lot of trouble. I'll talk about rear screen a little bit. Uh, they didn't have green screen, blue screen, CGI. They didn't have any of that kind of stuff. They did it all right in the camera. Uh, and so for something as simple as a dissolve, they would be cranking the film. For, remember, it was hand cranked. And slowly close the iris. Okay, then back the film. Reverse crank the film back into the camera. And then go to your next scene or location or whatever and then start cranking the camera forward while opening the iris up. Okay, so one shot is sort of fading out, the other shot is fading in, and that's how you get a dissolve. Now today, of course, it's done on computers and all that, but they actually figured out how to do dissolves in the camera, not in labs or anything like that. It was done right in the camera. Uh, doing stuff in labs and stuff didn't happen until uh, into the 1930s or so. So all during the teens and twenties dissolved split screens, same way. They would cover up half of the camera and shoot half of the scene. Maybe uh, uh, somebody's playing twins, okay? They, they had lots of these things but playing twins and so stop the camera, uh, cover up the other side of the camera, re rewind the film back into the camera and then expose the other half of the film. Okay, all done in the camera. And uh, glass shots, you'll see how they do glass shots in the documentary, miniatures, models, all that stuff, hanging miniatures, which is sort of the, the ultimate because um, it wasn't just a, uh, a, a drawing. And they actually figured out how to put drawings on pieces of glass, hang them in front of the camera, and then have that stuff appear on distant mountains and things like that. They could have them appear on mountains, a whole... Spanish Village or something like that could appear uh, in Southern California, right, in the Hollywood Hills. <laughs> uh, and the paintings were really quite good, and uh, it looks really good. So um, enjoy, uh, enjoy the documentary on camera effects in the silent era, and you'll really learn. Uh, you'll really learn a lot. It's quite, it's quite a good one. Um, and by the way, the documentaries that we're watching today in class, um, the, you're not going to find them anywhere else, I don't think. And that's because they couldn't get uh, clearance from all of the copyright holders. And there was a wonderful uh, series on television way back in the maybe the 1980s. Uh, and it was called Hollywood. I think it was just called Hollywood. Yeah, it's just called Hollywood. You'll see it. And, um, and it was the silent era. And it was a, a very well done documentary The the the, the guy that put it together, he wrote a book to go with it. Kevin Brown was his name. It was a wonderful documentary, and I loved it. And when I started teaching this class, I thought, oh, great, I'll be able to show these documentaries from the Hollywood from back then. And they weren't on YouTube, and they weren't at Amazon. I couldn't find them anywhere. And um, I thought, oh, darn, that's too bad. Uh, but I remembered I had uh, tape, video, VHS. I had tapes of 
most of the shows, just about all of them, I think there are about 10 shows. And so I dug in my attic or wherever it was and found my tapes, transferred the tapes to, uh, transferred them uh, to computer. Uh, and there, there's a way to do it. And uh, so I transferred this VHS stuff, VHS stuff to uh, computer. I did editing on Final Cut Pro and uh, digitized them and burned DVDs out of them and, and uh, uploaded them to uh, YouTube and all of that. So I was lucky that um, I kind of tech savvy. I taught video production and 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 uh, computer editing, nonlinear uh, editing, all that kind of stuff. So I was able to take these VHS tapes from back in the 80s and put them up. And that's what you'll be watching today in class. Um, and uh, part of the reason why they are not, uh, why they're not just there on YouTube, you'd think, why not? What the heck? Um, a lot of these old film studios are no longer around, and who owns the copyright and the trademark and all that kind of stuff from a hundred years ago? Apparently, they just they, they could do it to show on television, but they couldn't get the rights to make VHS tapes and DVDs and you know, YouTube and all that other kind of stuff. So. My, uh, the stuff you're going to see that I have put up is um, uh, uh, not available. It's not re readily available anywhere. So um, enjoy that. And the other thing about that, uh, those documentaries that you'll see, uh, and there's one on Max Sennett and Hal Roach and Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton, all that, uh, that you're going to most of that that you're going to see in class today. Uh, it was done in the 80s, so people that actually worked in the silent era were still alive back then. They would have been probably in their 80s. If they were 20 in 1920, then they would have been in their 80s in the 1980s. Uh, so that's kind of cool. They were still alive and they could interview them and all that. It was first-hand uh, interviews, not second or third-hand interviews. Uh, now it's 30 some years later, 35, almost, almost 40 years later, and they have all passed on. Um, but in those documentaries that you'll see, those were all people that were working in, in the silent era. So that makes it um, doubly cool, I think. Okay, anyway, uh, so check out special effects, and then when you're done, come on back. This is the camera. I think I showed this in the first class. This is an uh, old hand-cranked camera. Uh, you'd be cranking this uh, right here and uh, forward, uh, which would be, I guess that would be sort of a clockwise, and then uh, if you needed to do your, your dissolve or something, you'd crank it backwards and crank the film back into the camera again. You'd have to put the lens cap uh, over the, the cover there, over the lens, and, and all that, right? But they figured it out. That's very cool. They figured it out after a very short period of time, um, probably for panning and tilting, I'm guessing. Uh, and uh, there we have a classic. Tripods, a lot of tripods look just like this uh, even today, so that's kind of cool, and I love the handle on the top. Pick up the whole thing. Of course, when sound came in and all that, cameras got quite a bit bigger, that's for sure. Okay, so for color, uh, I, I get uh, questions um, from students quite a bit about color. When did they start making movies in color? So I did some research and added this section to it, uh, and you have it in the syllabus, so it's right there in Canvas uh, or as a handout, depending on how we're teaching the class. But um, basically, uh, films have always had color if, if they chose to make them in color. And that is, uh, as we saw in A Trip to the Moon, hand coloring frame by frame. Here's a shot from A Trip to the Moon, Georges Méliès, 1902, and 35 millimeter film is only about two, two and a half inches wide, so uh, it's a pretty tiny picture that you're coloring by hand. And of course, every version of the film would be slightly different because every, every picture was hand painted, so it wouldn't be exact. Uh, but hand coloring, yeah, it was very, uh, very labor intensive and time consuming, but it was color, right? You can see color movies from 1902, um, and I know that's not what a lot of students are thinking of when they're asking me about color. But yeah, technically it's color, hand coloring. The next step was the bath process. And in the 1920s, and you'll notice with some of the films uh, that we watch, 
an entire scene. It might be sort of blue. Blue is kind of a good shortcut or good code for nighttime. So a lot of times when they want to do nighttime, uh, you'll see blue. Deserts, of course, would be bathed uh, in yellow. So deserts are always great for yellow. Jungle for green. Uh, sometimes sepia, which is this sort of golden brownish uh, sort of a color, uh, might be added. And then just regular uh, grayscale stuff. So um, uh, at one point in the 1920s, more than 80% of films had some kind of color on them, whether they were hand-colored or very likely bath process or something like that. And with the bath, bath process, you can do it scene by scene. So if there's a scene that takes place at night, you can, you can bathe that scene in uh, blue, and, uh, and then you can go back to grayscale or, you know, you can go back to uh, uh, yellow, deserty stuff, all that stuff. So that's the bath process. Also in the 1920s, a two-strip color process uh, comes along, and that means cameras are bigger. They have to run two strips of film through the camera, and there's some kind of a prism and things like that. This is a Douglas Fairbanks movie. I believe it's The Black Pirate. And, yeah, it's not quite. I'm not sure blue and red, but not green, maybe, something like that, RGB. I'm not sure exactly uh, what they're missing, but um, in some movies they would do a, a few scenes in two-strip color process in the 1920s when they weren't doing uh, bath, profit, bath process stuff. Okay, now what you're waiting for, what most people are waiting for, is a realistic color, and we get that in 1932, 33, 34, in the early 30s, we get a, uh, we get Technicolor. Three strips. Uh, this is Gone with Wind from 1939. Um, to me, it looks like somebody has turned up the saturation knob. Um, they didn't have saturation knobs back then, of course. Uh, sometimes when I take pictures with my, with my camera phone, um, and uh, I like to I like to boost the saturation a little bit if I'm taking pictures of, of uh, nature somehow co uh, clouds and grass and whatever and the ocean and whatnot I, I like to I like to bump the color up a little bit um, and it kind of looks like uh, uh, that's what they did in Technicolor it, it seems um, uh, especially colorful I guess you might say and sometimes when we see people and and uh, later on, we will talk about Gone with the Wind, and there will be clips of it and all that kind of stuff. It almost looks like they're putting on a little bit more makeup than they need to put on, if you know what I'm saying. Um, lips are pretty darn red, and cheeks are rosy pink and all that, and um, it's not quite what we're used to today. If I hadn't have mentioned it, you might not have noticed it, but um, the color seems to me to be a little bit... Uh, much, I guess, a little oversaturated. But for the most part, you probably are hardly even going to notice it. Wizard of Oz, of course, is in color, but not very movies were in color uh, in those early days. And part of the reason is that uh, people, uh, customers, the viewing audience, is voting with their pocketbooks, basically. Ba basically, uh, when sound came in, in uh, late 1927, people voted, uh, yes, we love sound, we're going to almost stop going to see, uh, we're almost going to stop going to see uh, um, uh, silent movies, and we're going to go to see movies that are almost exclusively talkies. And basically that's voting, okay, with your attendance, with your pocketbook. And so, uh, all the studios got the picture within about three years, and movies were all pretty much uh, talkies, pretty fast, by, from between 27 and 30. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into the talkies in a, in a few more classes. Um, but with color, uh, people would go see black and white movies and color movies, and so uh, black and white movies stuck around for like 30 years. About 30 years, but they were still making plenty of black and white movies in the 1960s. Walt Disney even, who loved color for his animation, uh, did The Absent Minor Professor in black and white. The Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, is in black and white. Stanley Kubrick's amazing. Dr. Strangelove is in black and white. So there were plenty of black and white movies in the 1960s. And people 
went to see them, right? They could have just not gone to see them, and then the studios would have gotten the would have gotten the picture and would have stopped producing films in uh, black and white. So think about that today with 3D. Most of my students, when I have students in class and I ask how many have seen a 3D and 3D movie, uh, you know, whatever since uh, since the New Year or something like that, and a very few hands go up, and basically uh, you and me are voting that, eh, 3D, no big deal, okay, no big deal. It's been around for, you know, close to 10 years, and we don't care. So that's kind of the way the audiences were back in the 1930s and 1940s. There's color, and they're like, eh, it's okay, it's nice, we like it, but not a big deal. We're still going to see black and white movies, so we are voting with our pocketbooks. Anyway, part of the problem is this camera. Oh my god, look at this camera. It's a monster. Okay, you can put it on wheels and everything. I don't know how many people had to push it around, but it is a big camera. And why is it so big? Well, let's look inside. And there are three strips of film in there. There's three strips of film in there. I, I, I presume there's a... a, a um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, prism. I presume there's a prism in there splitting the light apart uh, to the three strips of film, RGB, and then they have to uh, layer them back on top of each other again in the lab. And, you know, so it's kind of a big deal to do uh, color, this big monstrous uh, color camera. And uh, so with color, um, uh, there's just... Um, uh, it's expensive. Not all the, not every studio, not a lot of small studios, especially like like Mac Senate and stuff like that, can afford a big monster camera like that and the extra cost and everything. And so when we get to uh, color, then they have to think, you know, are the costumes going to clash with the backgrounds? And you know, how, how about makeup? We have to think about putting makeup on people and all that sort of thing. And um, uh, so costumes come into play, uh, set design comes into play, makeup comes into play, the cameras come into play. It's kind of a big deal. It's kind of a big deal. Before, you're just thinking about the grayscale. Is it lighter or darker? So here we see, uh, 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 since 1932, 1933, we have color. Finally, in 1941, a single strip process can be used. Okay, so... We don't need those big monster cameras anymore. 20 years in, 20 years in, only a third of American films are in color and probably less of foreign films. Um, Technicolor's gone, and we have single strip film. Okay, uh, standard. Ha half of films um, in uh, 25 years are finally in, like, yeah, about 20... 23, 24 years, only half of American films are in color. In the late 50s, we get a blue screen process. There's 12 steps to the blue screen process. It's quite complicated, but they used it in films uh, like uh, 2001 and Star Wars and things like that. Finally, 1968, virtually 100% of films are in color. Uh, there are still black and white movies today. Um, uh, Mel Brooks... Young Frankenstein was in black and white in the 1970s, and uh, Woody Allen uh, with uh, Manhattan was in black and white in the 70s. So there's people are still making black and white movies kind of as a specialty item, not because they can't afford the camera or not because they, 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 they don't want to go in that direction. It's more of a sort of an artistic decision. But look at that. From 32 to 68, it took for... Uh, 100% of U.S. films to be in color. Okay, so um, a lot of lot of uh, lot of movies over those years, and so the big films in color uh, were animation. Disney loved color; he pushed it, and of course, uh, Snow White and Pinocchio, and all those movies were in color, and uh, and even uh, Popeye cartoons and other animated films were in color, and then a lot of musicals. Uh, this is from uh, this is from um, Singing in the Rain, I believe. Yeah, I think that's from Singing in the Rain. And that is in uh, color. That's from the early 1950s. So 
Some studios like MGM, they pushed color for their musicals, and then Disney pushed color for his animated films, and then a lot of stuff um, not. And like I say, partly it costs a lot extra money. Uh, color film needs a lot of light to activate the chemicals that are on the film. Okay, remember, it's a, it's a photochemical process, and color film needs a lot of light to activate those special color, whatever, particles sitting there uh, on the celluloid. So giant studio lights, or outdoors, right? You're, you're either outdoors under the sun or studio lights that are about as bright as the sun. I mean, it, it really, and it uses a lot of electricity too, believe it or not. A lot of electricity, you could be blowing fuses and power stations and all sorts of stuff too, uh, with all the, all the light that's needed. Now, as an artistic decision, two genres in particular for me, personally, film noir, uh, is fantastic in black and white. Uh, I really just love it. It's, it's great in black and white. And the other one would be horror. Uh, uh, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, um, and, and Dracula and so on. I, I don't really want to see them in, in color. I don't want them hand colored or computer colored or any kind of color. They are beautiful works of art as they are. Okay, now that's my, that's my personal opinion. Everybody has their own different personal opinions and so on. Uh, a lot of fine art photography like Ansel Adams worked exclusively in black and white. So um, as an art or an art form or an art choice, uh, you can make a pretty good case for black and white. And like I say, they're, they're still doing some black and white stuff today. Sometimes to evoke, right? Maybe on a TV show, somebody gets uh, knocked out and they have that dream, that 1940s film noir flashback dream, something like that. Lots of dream sequences and stuff like that said in the past might opt for uh, some black and white. But there are other black and white movies too. Um, and I know a lot of my students have a lot of pushback. It's the first time I've ever seen a black and white movie or it wasn't bad for a black and white movie, which is sort of a backhanded compliment. Um, I didn't think I'd like a black and white movie, all that kind of stuff. And imagine yourselves in 30 years. Imagine yourselves in your 50s with young 19-year-old uh, kids saying, uh, hey dad or granddad, how could you watch, or grandma, how could you watch all that flat screen stuff? How come you didn't watch everything in 3D? Right? And to them, in 30 years, it will just seem obvious. Who could, how could you watch a flat movie like they did back in the 2020s? And that's the way we're kind of thinking about these people in, uh, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. How could they watch how could they watch black and white movies? And people could ask us the same question in maybe 30 years, something like that. So, um, yeah, um, like I say, uh, color, 30 plus years, sound, three years. Okay, so, uh, next topic. Silent comedy. Okay, and I think this is this is the stuff. I'm sure this is the stuff that people remember the the most fond uh, most fondly of the silent era. It holds up quite well. When you see your Chaplin and your Keaton, you're gonna laugh. It holds up very well. It's very funny. It's nicely done. If you watch a drama, there's lots of talking. There's lots of title cards and all that. The acting seems a little bit big and a little bit broad. And uh, drama, I don't think, works nearly as well. Action works fine also, right? Any of that Douglas Fairbanks stuff, it, it's great. Lots of wonderful action. He was, he was you know, quite good at all of that. And, uh, and comedy especially holds up very, very well. Um, drama, really, it needed sound, I think. I think really, you know, when sound came in in 1927 by 1930, drama got a lot uh, different and a lot better. Uh, and um, with, uh, with scripts and, and all that. Who wants to read um, paragraphs every few, every minute or so? Okay, and some um, of these 1920s films, uh, they're trying to tell this big story, and the only way they can think of to tell the story is to keep putting these title cards up. And they're called intertitles because they're not at the bottom of the screen. They're uh, we see a picture, and then we would see just the title. And you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll see some, 
some uh, title cards, enter title cards, they're called. Um, and they just go on and on and on. Who wants to read all that uh, kind of stuff? And so the best films were told visually, right? A visual medium, action visually, comedy visually, right? You don't need all those words and everything to be funny. And Chaplin and Keaton in particular um, competed. Who could use the fewest title cards? Who could use the fewest, the fewest title or enter title cards more precisely? And um, one German director um, did his whole movie without a title card at all. He told the whole movie visually, and it works fine. You really don't need it. So silent comedy, very uh, visual and physical. So slapstick. There's actually a thing called a slapstick. It looks like a big old paddle, but there's a there's a, another piece to it that sort of slaps against it, like sort of like a piece of leather, or something like that. So when you when you sort of slap it, it makes a real loud slapping sound. And so they would use that on stage in vaudeville and things like that uh, to do comedy. So it made a loud sound. You didn't have to whack somebody very hard to make it sound loud. And so that's a slapstick, a real thing, a slapstick. Pratt Falls, you're going to learn how to do Pratt Falls in the documentary on, uh, on camera effects and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, or maybe on Max Senate, I'm not sure. But uh, I know in one of those documentaries, you're gonna uh, you're gonna learn about um, uh, learn about Pratt Falls, um, physical comedy, seltzer water in the face, pie in the face, all that kind of stuff, slipping on a banana peel, yeah, yeah, all that great stuff. Okay, so uh, these two uh, guys, uh, Mac Senate, first by maybe four or five years, and then Hal Roach. Um, Quickly right after that and they were studio heads of small studios they weren't big studios like MGM or Paramount or Warner Brothers or Fox okay they were small studios they made almost exclusively comedy for a while and there were lots of these small studios sprouting up in Hollywood some of them would make only westerns um, and some of them would make only serials uh, and we'll talk about serials later on with uh, like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and they would be shown once a week uh, in theaters and then to be continued the next week to keep people coming back and like a serialization to keep people coming back to see, especially kids, especially kids coming back to see how uh, our, our heroes were going to go. And that was a big influence on Star Wars and Indiana Jones, by the way, all those serials. Okay, so anyway... Um, small studios like Senate's studio and Hal Roach, uh, but they had some amazing talent uh, like like Charlie Chaplin and like Laurel and Hardy and uh, Buster Keaton and uh, and people like that. So uh, really, they 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 sure had the talent. Okay, and speaking of talent, Harold Lloyd and he was at Hal Roach Studios. Uh, the glasses guy, I guess, is as close as we can get. Uh, he looked sort of the most normal, and there were some really odd, I won't call them grotesque, but some odd-looking comedians uh, and so on with odd mustaches and odd eyebrows and hair and all that kind of stuff. And I know they must have thought that bowler hats were kind of funny because Chaplin wore a bowler hat, and so did Laurel and Hardy, and a few others. I guess somebody decided they looked kind of funny. I don't know. Um, this is a straw boater, by the way. That's a straw boater hat. All hats have names, right? We know baseball hats and all that, and, uh, top hats. So all hats have names, and there are lots and lots of hats uh, in movie history. Men, it was really part of a uniform. If you wore a, a, a coat and a tie, you, you wore a hat. That's part of what men wore into the 1960s. Into the 1960s, part of your thing, if you wore... If you wore a tie to work, not, not if you were a laborer or anything like that, but if you wor worked in an office, you would wear a hat to work. So, uh, the, 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 I guess the glasses guy, and he looks fairly normal compared to uh, Buster Keaton and, uh, and uh, Chaplin. And his famous film is called Safety Last from 1923. And I have a wonderful how they did that stunt uh, documentary. It's on about 10 minutes long, but uh, be sure to watch that and you'll see how they did that stunt because they didn't have rear screen projection. 
Now, let me just talk about rear screen projection. You, you probably know what it is. Now today we would have blue screen or green screen, but basically somebody would go and shoot all of this uh, way high on a building, and then they would get a screen and project it on the screen from behind, and then he, that would be the ground. He'd be sort of on the ground, and they'd you could project stuff on the screen. And that's mostly how they had people driving cars and stuff like that. They would go out, drive around town, shooting um, uh, traffic scenes, point the camera out the, out the side or out the front or out the back. Usually they'd drive around in like trucks and with cameras and, and shoot that. And then when they uh, wanted people to be uh, seen driving a car, they could put them in the car and light them up very nicely right on the sound stage maybe even blow a little bit of wind if it was a convertible, and then project the traffic behind them. Okay, not today, it would be blue screen or green screen, but basically they would put that behind them. And that would have solved this problem, but they didn't have that yet. They didn't have that rear screen projection stuff. Part of it is that the film back there would have been projected, and then there's a camera shooting all this, so now you've got to sync up the shutter speeds on the cameras so that you don't get flicker. Uh, you can't project this too bright, or you can't project it too dark, or it doesn't work right. It needs to look realistic. And so it took them until about 1930. And I've done some research on this. I don't have it like the date or anything, but uh, rear screen projection would have solved so many of these problems, especially for the comedies and stuff. Uh, but that's not until about 1930. So all during this, they're doing it basically live in the camera. He is that high. Now what we can't see is right down here is a landing. Okay, and you'll see the documentary. You'll see how they did it in the documentary. It's really quite nice how they did that stuff. So, uh, uh, there we go. Harold Lloyd and Safety Last. Next up we have Buster Keaton. He has uh, aged pretty well. He is held in very high esteem. There are lots of people that think he's even better than Chaplin. Um, I'm not sure it's quite that good, but uh, a lot of people think that, uh, that Keaton really is way up there, way high. Most people group of these three, all three together, but um, Buster Keaton, you call him the great stone face, part of his thing. No matter what was going on, if the train was going into the water from the bridge or who knows what big giant stunts that practically a whole house uh, fell on his head a very famous shot but the but the window uh, lands sort of around him so that the whole side of the house falls around him and the window very uh, very dramatically uh, saves him from being crushed okay and you'll see that um, in the length that I have I've got some nice lengths for uh, for Buster Keaton um, and one of them, a real nice one that's more modern, called The Art of the Gag, that I like quite a bit. So you'll see how Keaton uh, did comedy and gags and physical stunts, of course, physical. They weren't verbal gags or anything like that. Every once in a while, you'll see kind of a, a verbal, you know, in the intertitle. Um, but for the most part, it's, uh, it's uh, live physical stuff. And so his best films, Sherlock Jr., and Steamboat Bill Jr., I guess Jr., kind of, maybe they thought it was funny, not sure. Uh, the General uh, is considered, I think, his best film. That's set during the Civil War, and The General is the name of a train. And he is going to, uh, his, his beloved General has been stolen from him, and he goes to steal the train back. It's big, big stuff, big stunts, big elaborate stuff. Uh, the Navigator, I think that's the one where the house just about falls on his head. The cameraman is wonderful, too, and Steamboat Bill Jr. So some great stuff from Buster Keaton. I think you'll love Buster Keaton, and you're all going to pick a film to do for your very first paper. Remember, your very first paper is uh, on a silent film, and then after that, your next three papers can be all sound, so you only really have to watch one, and they're not bad. You're going to like them. You're going to like them. Don't worry. It's black and white. It's silent. It's okay. You're going to love it. Um, and most people pick either Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin. A lot, of, a lot of people pick one of those two, or maybe Harold Lloyd. Um, there's uh, some other good stuff I have to say. Uh, Metrop if you're into science fiction, Metropolis with uh, robots and flying cars and all that, it's a very cool movie. It's a very cool movie. 
uh, Metropolis. So if you're a sci-fi fan, uh, uh, Robots, Robot Maria, and all that's really an amazing movie. But uh, the vast majority of my students pick uh, Keaton and Chaplin, and that's fine. The choice is yours. Um, generally, uh, as long as I'm talking about the papers, uh, we want to watch feature films, so not two-reelers. Not two-reelers, I think it's pretty carefully spelled out in the syllabus, but a two-reeler means it's only a 20-minute movie, and there are hundreds and hundreds of Chaplin two-reelers and hundreds of Keaton two-reelers. You need to watch more than two reels, okay? So you can't just watch a 20-minute movie and somebody else watches, uh, you know, a feature two-hour movie. Um, but some of Keaton's films are only about 45 minutes long, and that's okay. They're, they're good. They're features. It's a little on the short side. I was going to cap it at an hour, uh, but then I checked and I saw that um, a lot of Keaton's best work is less than an hour. So um, as long as it's not a two-reeler, it's got to be more than 20 minutes, and these are all feature films. So these are okay, but you got to stay away from the 20-minute films from any of these guys. Okay, and I think that's only fair. All right, so uh, Buster Keaton, and now uh, the big guy, Charlie Chaplin, the little tramp, and um, we got to we got to talk about that because let's just I'm just going to have a quick a full picture of him here, and I'm going to go back. There he is. His pants are too big, his shoes are too big, his jacket's too small. I think his hat's maybe kind of on the small side. Okay, and so. Basically, he's a homeless guy. He's a tramp. He's a homeless guy. And he, the implication is nothing fits because he found it in the trash. Okay, he found it in the trash and maybe he went down to the creek and washed it out or something like that. But he wants to look uh, like, uh, you know, a middle class gentleman, right? He wears a tie. I don't know how many homeless people wear ties today. Um... But, you know, he, want, he, he has a cane. He has a nice walking stick. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back again. He's got, the, he's got a nice walking stick, uh, uh, like a cane. He's got the tie, uh, a vest. I, I can't tell if we can... Yeah, he's got a vest on. Yeah, he's got a vest. So he's, um, you know, trying to dress as nicely as he can, but this stuff is probably kind of smelly. Uh, he sleeps um, in the park or in a box or under the bridge or who knows what. And think of it, the biggest star in the world, probably ever, the biggest star in the world ever uh, was a homeless guy. It just amazes me every time I think about it. Now, of all the people in this class that we're going to talk about, and these, a lot of these people were really big stars, like Buster Keaton, and when we get into the sound era, Clark Gable, and Humphrey Bogart, and you probably don't know which one's which? Which one's Clark Gable? Which one's Humphrey Bogart? Which one is Groucho Marx? Which one is Harpo Marx? You probably don't know. And that's fine, right? That really, it doesn't show how little you know. It just shows how fleeting fame is. Fame is very fleeting. The very most famous people. There are presidents. Presidents of the United States. You'd be hard-pressed to pick out which one was, was Grover Cleveland, probably, and which one was Warren G. Harding. Okay, and they were presidents of the United States, and you probably couldn't pick, could pick them out of a lineup. Okay, so even presidents, right? Fame is fleeting. You gotta be as famous as Lincoln, or as famous as Washington, or Jefferson, or as famous as Chaplin, for people to know who you are a hundred years later. Or Marilyn Monroe. I would think most people would know Marilyn Monroe, and I would bet most of you knew Chaplin uh, before taking this class, but almost. Everybody else is brand new. You probably didn't know Douglas Fairbanks or Mary Pickford. And when we get to the stars, which one's Gene Harlow and which one is Greta Garbo? You probably don't know. And they were huge stars. Every bit as big as Jennifer Lawrence or um, anybody today. Name your, name your big star, Sandra Bullock, right? The biggest star today. And I guarantee in 50 years... When you say, oh, Jennifer Lawrence, she was the big star back then when I was a, you know, and they're going to look at you like I'm talking about Greta Garbo. You have no idea who Greta Garbo is, and your kids or grandkids are going to have no idea who Jennifer Lawrence is, okay, or Meryl Streep or whatever. And that's fame. That's fame. It's not ignorance 
or anything like that. It's really just that fame is very, very fleeting. And people that study this stuff, that study history, presidents, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. And so now you're taking a history of motion picture class and you're going to know who these people are. You're going to be able to pick out which one is Groucho and which one is Harpo because you studied it. But until you studied it, you probably wouldn't have been able to make those distinctions. Okay, enough about all that. Part of it is how famous Chaplin was, the most famous person on the planet. They knew Chaplin in China and Japan, Africa, everywhere. Not just America and Europe. Not just America and Europe, but everywhere. He was uh, English. Uh, he came to the country, to the U.S., uh, touring. He was touring in a live stage show, and he would play old men and drunks and stuff like that. They saw him at, uh, at Max Sennett's time, and they hired him, and he had quite a, uh, quite a stratospheric, uh, sort of uh, uh, right into the stratospheric career. Uh, within a year, he was a huge, huge star. By 1914, a year in, he was probably the biggest star in the country. They signed him, I think, in 1913, 1914. His little tramp character was born. It became a big... Uh, big star. He went from one contract to a bigger contract to a million dollar contract, all that kind of stuff very, very fast. And within maybe five years or so, he was, uh, he had his own studio um, and uh, writing and directing and I don't know about editing, but probably uh, directing someone else to do the editing. Uh, he even wrote the music and they would play music in, you know, uh, silent movie theaters, they'd play music and stuff, and he would even write the music. A real genius, a real genius, just the most amazing person that you can imagine. Um, and um, so part of his genius, and I've got lots of nice links, so make sure you watch the links. There's the Gold Rush, there's a, there's a Chaplin bit from our uh, Hollywood documentary, there's a Modern Times documentary from 1936, which is still kind of silent. There are uh, people talking in radios and televisions, uh, believe it or not, in modern times. Uh, there's an assembly line in The Great Dictator from 1941. Uh, that is actually his uh, talkie, and that is the film. Um, well, uh, let's, I'm sorry, I'm going through all these films. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, Modern Times from 1936, Great Dictator from 1940, and um, that is the one where he plays a Jewish barber. He wasn't Jewish, but he played a Jewish barber, and he played Adenoid Hinkle, which is Adolf Hitler. And in The Great Dictator, we're going to see it's not a swastika, but it's two X's, which, of course, you would read as a double cross. Okay? Yeah. So, uh... His biggest hit, by the way, The Great Dictator, poking fun at Hitler. Most everybody in Hollywood was kind of being nice to the Nazis and being nice to the Germans because we were still selling our movies in Germany, even while Hitler was in. Uh, Hitler came in in 33, uh, so 34, 35, 36, 37, right? They, we were still selling our movies in Germany. Uh, it was a big market over there in Germany. Um, d had no idea that Hitler was going to be the, the, the maniac that he was. Remember, the Olympics were held in Germany in 1936, right? They held the Olympics in, in Germany in 1936. That's where our great track star Jesse Owens won four gold medals, uh, really humiliating the, uh, uh, the, the, the white super race, right, that, that Hitler was trying to put together, the, the Nordic Aryan Superman, and here comes this this African-American, and he, he beats everybody quite handily. Okay, anyway, uh, I don't want to get too far into history here, but uh, we had no idea what was going on in Germany in the 30s, um, and so American movies were over there, and we'll talk about it more when we get closer to World War II, but um, Chaplin took him on in 1940 and made this amazing film, The Great Dictator, and I have a couple of links to it. I think there's three links to The Great Dictator. It's an amazing film, but, but... It's a talkie, so you have to save it for one of your last three papers. Don't do The Great Dictator for your first paper. Your first paper has to be a silent movie, which means before about 1927 or so, or 1930. It needs to be a silent movie. So it's Great Dictator, fantastic movie. Save it for a later paper. Uh, you can do these other ones, though. 
Um, most everybody in Hollywood was talking by uh, 1930, but Chaplin is basically making silent movies, and he was about the only one that really could draw an audience to a silent movie uh, when everybody else was going to see the talkies because he was Chaplin, and everybody loved Chaplin. And they kind of, and in, um, I think it's Modern Times, it might be City Lights, he sings, but he sings a song in gibberish, um, and he's sort of making it up. It sounds vaguely Italian, but it's not Italian, so you get to hear his voice. Um, and he had a, quite a nice voice. He sounded sounded very good. Um, and um, even though he came from a very low class background, he he didn't have much of an act. He spoke quite well, quite nicely. He lived a lot of, long time in in the U.S. in Southern California, so he uh, had had a vaguely British accent. Uh, anyway, so Charlie Chaplin, great stuff. A lot of stuff there on YouTube. Um, I've linked to what I think are some of the best stuff, the stuff that I would have shown in class. Um, and uh, But there's so much more. So if you get into Chaplin, um, or just pick one of his movies, pick one of these movies, I would say, uh, for your first paper and, and enjoy that. Uh, and he really was uh, quite a genius. Um, now, i got to tell the kind of the ending story of Chaplin here because it's kind of weird. Not weird, kind of sad. Chaplin was... Um, a liberal. We'll just call him a liberal. I don't really think he was a socialist. He certainly wasn't a communist or anything like that. Um, but he never became an American citizen. Some people didn't like that, even though he lived here since 1913. And uh, um, in the late 1940s, there was a there was the communist uh, anti-communist hysteria sweeping the country and in Hollywood, and people uh, wondering if people were sympathetic. Uh, to communism, um, and even just being leftist or liberal and all that, and Chaplin was quite outspoken. He was, you know, pretty famous and pretty rich, and they tend to be outspoken type people. And, um, but, you know, he made, he paid all his taxes, he paid lots of taxes here in the U.S. and made American movies and made Hollywood movies um, as big as they uh, were, really. It swept the world, still, really, the biggest industry. In, in the world, the, the American film industry. So he was a big part of all that, big part of all that. And he went uh, to uh, Europe in uh, 19, I think 1950, 51, 52, somewhere in the early 50s when this uh, anti-communist hysteria, they wanted him to testify to Congress about his politics and was he ever uh, a communist or anything like that. And while he was on his ship sailing uh, for Europe, they pulled his passport and said that he would have to reapply for his passport when he came back to America. And that was quite offensive to him. I mean, he was, he really, not single-handedly, but he really helped build the whole industry. He was very offended and he didn't come back. He stayed in Europe. He sent for as much stuff as he could get sent. They boxed it up, sent it. He ended up living in Switzerland for quite a while. He would not come back and talk to the to the uh, uh, House Un-American Activities Committee in the early 1950s. And um, he was away uh, from Hollywood for all that time, from 1950 until uh, sometime in the late 1970s, I believe it was. <clears throat> and uh, Hollywood had changed. It had gone from being, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth. And some people today say that Hollywood is... is full of lots of liberal types, and it's hard if you're conservative to find work in Hollywood uh, and so on, and that there's a conservative bias uh, against the conservatives in Hollywood, and that might be true. Um, but back in the early 1950s, the pendulum was on the other side, and it was very conservative, and people were very anti-liberal and anti-communist, anti-socialist, and anti-all anti that kind of stuff. So. Um, it's just, you know, it goes around, it comes around, the pendulum swings back and forth. And there was a time when Hollywood was very, very conservative. Now it's probably more liberal. But uh, they, uh, uh, by the late 1970s, Hollywood had gone uh, to the other side. They called and begged him for years to come back. He finally agreed to come back to the Oscar ceremony. And, um, and uh, he, came, he came in with a cane. He came in with a cane and did a little bit of a funny walk. His hair, of course, was all white and everything. He was in his 
80s, I think, maybe 78, maybe 80, something like that, 81, 82. And, um, and the place went nuts. The place went nuts. They stood up and they applauded and cheered for like five minutes. It's really, really something. It's really something. He, fi he finally went back to Hollywood and, and uh, it was a kind of a, you know, sorry, <laughs> kind of a sorry thing. It, you know, maybe a little late, but kind of a big sorry thing. And they gave him a special Oscar and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the clip of it's on YouTube. You can actually see that clip on YouTube. Uh, uh, so anyway, and he uh, uh, wrote his autobiography and all that kind of stuff. He was very smart as a business person. He owned his films. It wasn't a studio that owned his films or anything like that. He owned his films. He got very, very rich and very wealthy off of the ownership of all of his films and all of his intellectual property and material and all that uh, kind of stuff. Um, and lived quite comfortably and had kids and all that kind of stuff, but he did not grow old in America or in Hollywood, and that was politics uh, at play. So that's his, uh, that's his back story. Okay, anyway, uh, that more or less finishes it up for Charlie Chaplin and The Little Tramp, and so uh, although the wallpaper's down, we did some remodeling the last couple of weeks or so, so the wallpaper's down, but there I am in my office bidding you adieu until next class. Thank you so much for joining.